for that interview I enjoyed talking to her there. Now perioperative care is very important for all nurses to learn. All student nurses need to know about the principles of pre-op care and the principles of post-op care. Pre-operative care and post-operative care of a patient going for surgery. And what we're going to do now is we're going to run through this in uh, maybe a little more detail and look at it on some notes. Now whether the, the sort of care a patient gets is going to depend to a degree obviously on the type of surgery and also on whether the procedure is elective or emergency. Now an emergency procedure is an operation the patient needs straight away that wasn't anticipated. For example, if they fracture a femur after a road traffic accident or rupture a spleen or get a perforated peptic ulcer, they're going to need surgery straight away. That's emergency surgery. Elective surgery is surgery which is planned in advance. So the type of care is going to depend on whether the the, the case is major or minor, or the type of surgery, or whether it's elective, or um, whether it's elective or emergency. But the principles are the same, really, from all pre and post operative care, and that's what we're going to look at now the principles. Now, the first potential problem, and indeed real problem, I want to talk about is patient anxiety. Now any patient that comes into hospital is going to be anxious. Something has gone wrong with their body that causes anxiety. But anxiety is a particular problem before surgery. All patients before surgery are going to be anxious. So it's an important part of the role of the nurse to reduce this anxiety as much as possible. And there's several things can be done other than giving uh, drugs to reduce anxiety. And I think, and, and indeed Jill brought this out, that the most important thing in many ways is for, to, for the nurse to establish a good relationship, a trusting uh, interpersonal relationship between the nurse and the patient. And this starts when the patient comes on the ward. So give them a friendly welcome to the ward. You know, it, it needs to be some formality, but not a cold formal welcome, but uh, it's got to be a friendly, a personal welcome. Welcome the patient as a person onto the ward. And this involves introducing yourself by name and introducing other members of your team and indeed other patients round about by name so that the patient feels orientated virtually as soon as he comes into the, to the clinical environment. And we need to explain the ward layout, where the kitchens are, where the toilets are, um, how, how they call a nurse when they need one and basic things like that can all help to make the patient feel more relaxed uh, and less uncomfortable, less anxious. Now sometimes we need to carry out procedures to the patient <clears throat> and it's vital that these are explained to the patient before the procedure begins. So sometimes nurses will tend to start a procedure and tell the patient what they're doing as they've started the procedure. If anyone actually does that to you, it's actually quite frightening. So explain to the patient what's going to happen before it happens so that the patient can relax knowing that nothing unexpected is going to happen to them. They're going to be told what's going to happen before it happens. Now patients will have many fears and anxieties and there'll be quite a lot of questions they want to ask. So establish a climate where the patient feels free to ask questions and clarify things. Because you could say that there's two types of fear <coughs> that a patient will have. One type of fear is fear which is justified yes, they are going to have an operation, okay, they'll be anaesthetized, but there's always an element of risk, and, and the very concept of surgery is frightening to patients. So yes, there is some understandable, justifiable anxiety. But as well as that, there is some unjustified anxiety. Patients might have fears about things which really don't exist. They might think things are going to happen to them, which you know cannot happen to them. So you can allay their anxieties about some unwarranted fears, unjustified fears, as long as the patient is free to ask the questions. So encourage patients to express their fears and anxieties, and as well as encouraging to express the fears and anxieties, create a climate where they feel free to ask questions. And of course the answer that you give to these questions is also going to be critical. Now some patients like to know every minute detail of what's going to be cut, what's going to be sewn, all the, all the minutiae of what's going to happen to them. Others just want to understand it in general principles. 
Others really don't want to know. They only want to know that they'll go down to the anaesthetic room, be put to sleep, and where they'll wake up. They want to know the basics. So you have to decide on an individual basis whether that patient wants a lot of detail or whether they just want fairly basic uh, information. So give appropriate answers to the patient's questions. And another aspect of giving appropriate answers to patient's questions is the ability of the patient to understand what you're talking about. There's no point giving an explanation that contains a lot of technical information if the patient doesn't understand that. So without patronising the patient, the level of information given must be appropriate to what the patient wants and their ability to understand. So give appropriate answers. And a final general principle when trying to reduce the patient's anxiety is involvement of friends, family, people that we call significant others, people that are important to the patient. So take time to communicate with friends, family members, significant others, and let them know what's going on as well. And that can also help to reduce the patient's anxiety. Now, as with all nursing procedures before surgery, there's information that we need to gain. We need to assess the patients. And most units have uh, standard admission documentation, which we would uh, complete as usual. But it's also very important to weigh the patient before surgery, if you have time to do this. And uh, one of the main reasons for this is the, the anaesthetists like to know the weight of the patient because it helps them gauge the dose of drugs that are required. So clearly, a heavier patient is going to require a higher dose of anaesthetic drugs than a lighter patient. And obviously children are going to require significantly less. So recording the weight of the patient and writing that on the notes is, is useful for the anaesthetist. And the other thing that we do as nurses, as soon as the patient, well not actually quite as soon as the patient comes in, but shortly after the patient has been admitted, it's useful if we record the temperature, pulse and blood pressure. Now, these are what we call baseline observations. So we should know what the patient's normal temperature, normal pulse and normal blood pressure are. Now temperatures don't vary that much between individuals, but pulse rates certainly vary quite a lot. Young fit people might have a pulse rate of 50. Uh, older unfit people may have a pulse rate of 90 or 95. So pulse rates do vary quite a lot. And blood pressures certainly vary quite a lot. So we need to know roughly what the normal is for that individual so that later on we can compare any changes with that normal. Now initially I said take these when the patient is first admitted, then I corrected myself. But the reason for that is that when the patients first come in they're particularly anxious so the pulse rates and blood pressures tend to be very high. So it's quite normal to find a patient's pulse is say 94 on admission and an hour or so when they've settled into the ward it's probably gone down to 70 or something. And again, the blood pressure, especially the systolic, can be quite high in admission, but then settle down. So take baseline observations once the patient has settled into the ward to compare them to observations during and after the operative procedure. And normally the doctors will clerk the patients in, but it's important for us to know any particular medical history as well. For example, does the patient have a history of heart disease? If they have, then we should perform uh, an ECG so that the anaesthetist can see the patient's ECG in case there's any particular treatment that needs managed. Has the patient got a history of respiratory disease? Is the patient a heavy smoker? All of these things can, can be significant. So any significant medical history should be noted and any appropriate action may then be taken. The other thing we do routinely is uh, test the patient's urine, a ward-based urinalysis. This can show such things as renal disease, 
but also if there's any sugar in it, for example, it might show that the patient might be an undiagnosed diabetic.